Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so we'll get going. Um, as um, those of you who are already listening will, will know, I'm talking to Richard Hulf of um, Hydrogen One Capital Growth uh, later on. But before we do that, there's a bits of um, news to talk about. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Brunner, which had its results this week. Um, it wasn't a particularly, you know, there wasn't an awful lot going on, but um, in, in my part of the world anyway. But I think Brunner is interesting and worth having a look at. Um, and then Richard's going to be talking about, um, Richard Williams here, who's going to be talking about Tritex Big World Reit and the UK commercial property deal. Um, so we'll see what he's got to say about that. So Brunner first. Um, this is a decent size global um, fund on about a 10 discount, which is widish, I think, although you, as you can see, it's sort of narrower than it has been for a while. It's not really obvious at the moment why its discount is wide. There was a long running thing. We go back um, a while ago that it had very expensive debt and that, that was a good reason for it to be trading uh, on a wide discount. But that's all sorted out now, I think. So. Um, there's no really good reason for that discount, and that's why I wanted to explore a bit more about what's going on. Within the peer group, uh, you know, there's lots of big funds in the peer group. It's still a reasonable size, obviously, half a billion quid. Um, and the ongoing charges ratio, it's not the most competitive, but it's still, you know, that's not a rate, it's 0.6. It does offer a dividend yield. We'll talk about more about income in a minute, um, although it's not massive, and that's not the main reason to own it. Um, it's been going for quite a long time. It's interesting because it's another one of these kind of family vehicles. So it was founded originally with the money that a family got from the sale of the Brunnemont business that, into ICI <clears throat> and back in 1926-27. And the family still got just shy of a quarter of it. Uh, one of the things that they're trying to do at the AGM now is, is to see if um, it's OK to buy a bit more shares uh, and sort of get a creeping control thing so that that percentage might go up if they don't sell. Um, and they're obviously quite sort of uh, wedded to it. One of the directors is normally someone happening to the family. At the moment, one of them is married to a family member. It's got a long record of dividend growth. So it's an ARC dividend hero. And you can see that here. And actually, you can see the effects of this slow, slow compounding of, of um returns um, of dividend income. So this is the, just the dividends going up here, but it's way ahead of inflation over time. Um, and I think that's really part of the whole thing about why it's, it's, these global growth funds are actually worth thinking about still. Um, and crucially, I think for their marketing message that they've now outperformed their benchmark for five consecutive years, which is not bad going uh, in an environment where lots of active managers have struggled. But as we'll come on, the, the benchmark that they're using is not the same as most of the other funds in the sector. Now, I think one of the reasons why it might be out of favour is that it's had an awful lot of um, manager moves in the last few years. So that five-year track record is not the sole responsibility of the current managers, um, because Lucy McDonald, I think everybody loved, um, left in May 2020, and that was a bit of a surprise, but there was a sort of lots of internal shenanigans going on in uh, Allianz, and, and that's what happened. Uh, and then Matthew Tillett, who took over from her, didn't last that much longer, so he went off in July 2022. And they promoted somebody internally to be the co-manager, and then they recruited externally um, to be the other co-manager. And that happened in November 22. So you've only really got about just every year's well, actually, I mean, these are these are we're going to look at the end of November 23 numbers. We've only got really a year of the new guy in. But the uh, underlying thesis hasn't really changed um, over that period. And maybe that consistency is something that you can sort of relax about. It's, just, it's supposed to be kind of like an all weather fund. So it's not a growth fund, not a value fund. Um, the weird thing and saying about the benchmark is that it has a big bias to UK, and that's an anachronism. That a lot of these funds used to do that, um, but not so many of them now. Um, and the rationale was, if you're a UK investor and you're investing in these things, it makes sense to have a lot of money in your home market. But that seems to have generally gone out the window now. But this benchmark is still 70% FTSE All World X UK and 30% FTSE All Share. Um, 
the weighting of the UK within the All Countries World Index is about three and a half percent. So you can see there's a there's a big big difference here, and if you construct your uh, portfolio to look like the benchmark, they say they don't let the portfolio the, the benchmark influence the portfolio, but they do maintain this this big UK bias. You see that's twenty four point six percent of the fund. That's at the end of December. It's a fairly concentrated portfolio. It's all put together for, by on a stock by stock basis, so they they're not looking top down at sectors and country weightings. There's obviously this gearing thing that they've had for a long time going on but it's quite modest they're focused on the sort of high quality high return on equity companies that reinvest their cash flows solid business models um and the I idea is if you get something that's compounding its earnings at sort of um 15 or something then um the value of that over time means that you can afford to pay up for it now so you, they're maybe sort of buying things that may be more expensive than you, you might do otherwise and so they're, they're not as bothered as some people might be about the opening valuation of these stocks now this is what was driving the returns for them um for the year to the end of november 23 um and it as i say it was quite a remarkable achievement to, to beat their, even their benchmark um given what was going on with the the rest of the world as we know there was a kind of magnificent seven of ai related stocks that really drove markets and big mega cap things if you didn't hold them then it was a real struggle to, to keep going and the fact that they've only really got their microsoft up there at the top um that does tell you really that um that there are other stock people must be not bad and you can see there's lots of unusual names in here so never nordisk is something that i think a lot of people hold that's the um company that's making the we go the uh, weight loss drug um, and, and that's got metal on the back of that um but there are some bits and pieces here that you might not recognize like like the baltic classifieds thing um and jumbo the greek retailer um so yeah i think that just the indication that maybe they are quite good stock pickers things have not everything goes right with the nuts by the that's sort of natural for all these things um but not holding four of those many from seven i think is um yeah, that, that just shows you the, the achievement they made this year. All going good. <clears throat> so this is what it stands up uh, like in, within the sector. So I've ranked this by five-year NEV growth. This is all annualised, so this is 11.5% a year. <clears throat> um, and it ranks second, so which is obviously pretty cool. Um, number one still is Scottish Mortgage, despite the really torrid time it's had more recently. Um, so but it's, those numbers are sort of coming down to meet these ones. Um, Alliance Trust is still up there. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that it had a much better year than Brunner last year. Um, but this is the difference that the benchmark makes. So if it was trying to beat the world index, um, instead of beating uh, the benchmark every every time period, as it does almost there, well, up to sort of just just by matching it over ten years, it would have, you know, definitely struggle a bit more. And it still would have done it, uh, but not as by as much. Um, and the fact that it's underweight, so maybe it had twenty four point six percent weight in the UK against um, thirty for the benchmark, that UK underweight alone would have accounted for a, a big chunk of its outperformance of its benchmark. So. I'm slightly thinking that I do, though I do like it, and if you read the annual report accounts, I mean, they, they really go to town explaining what they're doing and why they're doing it and why they hold the stocks they do. It really should be committed for that. But it's not as great, this this sort of five-year consecutive performance, as it, as it might look first on paper. So there, that's, that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Richard. Great, thanks, James. Yeah, so all I talk about at the moment is uh, is mergers in the real estate sector, and there's another one this week, or a um, a proposed merger. So um, this time it was Tritax Big Box Street um, looking to merge with a uh, UK commercial property, which um, for those of you who follow the commercial property sector doesn't really <laughs> tally that well with, uh, if you look at the portfolios. But um, we're going into more detail about that in a minute. I'm not sure what's happened there. Okay. Um, so 
yeah, so like I said, the all share merger posed by Big Box. Um, if you go back one, yeah, there we go. Um, so each UK commercial um, shareholder will get 0.444 or Big Box shares, which values the company at just under a billion, so about 924 million. Um, that's a premium to their share price. As we know, all property companies have been struggling um, share price wise. So um, no surprises there, but almost 10% discount to their NAV at the end of last year. So maybe a bit of um, bit of value still on the table there. Um, so on the next slides, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, so UK Commercials Chairman, um, Peter Perry Gray, um, is not supporting the deal at, at the moment. And um, that if you looked at the announcements on Monday morning, <laughs> two very conflicting announcements from um, Big Box and, and UK Commercial. Um, UK Commercials was um, was released on fr Friday evening, but only came out Monday morning. So it was a bit um, puzzling when they both came out together. But um, yeah, the rest of the board is is for it but apart from the chairman so i mean this is me speculating here but i'm I'm thinking maybe he wants to to keep a diversified approach the uk commercial property as we'll see in a minute is, is the biggest um diversified sort of traditional generalist um property company um so it would leave a big hole in that in that um sector for um for investors and and also he supported the merger last proposal last year from Picton, which would have been um, more of a ma better marriage than than this one portfolio wise. Um, but it did did reveal that there have been several approaches from Big Box for 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 this deal. Um, and, and more importantly, um, UK Commercial's largest shareholder, which is Phoenix Life, which owns forty three percent, is in support of the deal, as is their second largest um, investor. So about what was that fifty six percent is are, are for this deal so which tells you it's probably gonna probably gonna go through but interestingly so, to know that um so uk commercials manager is aberdeen which also owns 60 percent of big boxes manager tri tax management um and aberdeen also holds a big stake in phoenix life there so it it looks like it's all all going to be sort of kept in house with aberdeen if you've seen the news recently or over recent months that they're likely to lose their other fund, um, Aberdeen Property, which is going to merge with uh, Custodian, and their European um, logistics fund, Asley, is also put themselves up for sale. So we'll see what happens there. That could also merge with another TriTax um, fund, TriTax Eurobox, but we'll see what happens there. Um, so I'll just put up the... Um, the their peer groups. Um, UK, I've, I've ranked UK commercial by market cap, as you see there. So, like I said earlier, by far the biggest um, UK commercial um, diversified REIT. Um, obviously, LXI is merging with London Metric. They're more of a sort of long income stuff. Supermarkets is obviously supermarkets. So, as you see there, it's the biggest market cap, and that, and that will leave a big hole. Um, in that sector with balanced commercial CP, uh, BCP, T, uh, sort of half a billion. And then you've got, yeah, really small um, companies there. So that would be, it would be a shame to, for that one to, to drop out. Try tax bid box, you can see there, almost 3 billion market cap. We all know about how big these guys are. Um, and you see performance over the last five years on the next slide. So this is UK commercial. This this would be pretty similar to big boxes on the next slide as well. Massive doing well, and then a massive fall off in NAV and share price. Sort of middle of last year as interest rates started to come up, or sort of end of twenty two. So, um, and and the discounts are widened, and this is why we're seeing a lot of this M and A activity at the moment. So we look at the joint portfolios. Um, UK commercial about sixty percent in um, industrial and logistics. Um, big box obviously fully focused on logistics. It's got a, about seven percent in in development. So combined, there'll be about six point three billion. 
290 million in rental income a year and almost 4 billion market cap, which would make it the fourth largest UK REIT. Um, and this is what I assume will happen and, and probably will happen. They sort of alluded to it in their um, announcement that they'll sell off all the non-logistic stuff, about 500 million, and, and it will fund their development pipeline going forward. So they've got about just over 7 million consent, square foot consented, um, ready to go. They, they usually deliver about two to three million a year in new developments, and that produces about a six to eight percent yield on on cost. So about six to eight percent return on on what they're spending there. So it does make sense in that regard um, to fund this. There's there's no other um, the traditional routes of raising money is sort of not open to them at the moment with the cost of debt and and being on such a wide discount. So this does make sense. In that regard, um, but like I said, I'd, it'd be a shame to lose UK commercial just for their size in that in that diversified generalist sort of REIT sector. So, but we'll we'll see what happens over the next few weeks and months. Oh, cool, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I, I think it probably is just designed to get them to fund their pipeline because they can't raise money to do it otherwise. But yeah, there we go.